everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show and welcome to Forensics Talks. And uh, today we have a great guest and I'm really eager to get to uh, him today. Uh, just a few things before we start. And uh, first one is Happy Canada Day. It's Canada Day here, so it's a federal holiday. So a lot of people are off and I'm not sure if they're going to be um, watching this uh, or not. Um, I'm celebrating here in the office with my maple leaf uh, cookies here. I don't know if uh, that's a, a thing, a Canadian thing. I think it is. Um, if you are in the uh, on the YouTube channel or whatever, by all means, please uh, say hello and let us know where you're from. Uh, just type into the comments and would be uh, always great to know where people are from around the world. So I always like to see that. Uh, don't forget also that um, I will be having the Cloud Compare course uh, next week. So that's going to happen uh, on July 8th and July 9th. And what I'll do here in a second is I'll just uh, share my screen so that you can see uh, what I've got going on. So if you just go to the ai2-3d.com and you go down to the training, you'll get to the Cloud Compare course. And so if that is of interest to you, um, by all means, uh, have a look. If you have any questions, let me know, and I'd be happy to uh, answer them for you. Also, um, last week was the Canadian Society of Forensic Science Conference. And I want to say thanks to everybody who attended there. Uh, it was uh, a really enjoyable conference. Uh, a lot of uh, diversity, a lot of different people from all over the world, many different topics uh, and disciplines were represented. And uh, my next guest today is somebody who presented last week, although I knew him before and we had discussed this before. Um, we're gonna, he's going to be talking about the VirtoScan project, which was started in 2015 at the uh, Zurich Institute of Forensic Medicine. And uh, so the speaker today is uh, Soren Kotner, and he received his uh, Master of Science in Ecology and Evolution from the Goethe University in Frankfurt, Maine in 2013. And uh, during his studies, he specialized in 3D imaging and 3D plant morphologies. And you know me, if it's 3D, I'm, I'm pretty happy. And from 2013 to 2015, he was employed as a technical engineer in the field of optical scanning and 3D metrology um, by uh, Dua 3D AG. And since 2015, uh, he's working with the Vertopsy Group at the Zurich Institute of Forensic Med Medicine uh, at the University of Zurich. And his work is dedicated to the research and development of automated 3D imaging solutions and the standardization of multi-camera setups for forensic 3D whole body documentation. So let me bring him in here. There he is. Hey, Soren, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, being here today. I was uh, I was really pleased with your work and uh, the stuff that you presented at the uh, Canadian Society of Forensic Science uh, conference last week. And I uh, hope that uh, that went OK for you, too, and that uh, I think you got a few questions on that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, it was really good. There was a lot of uh, feedback. Um, I had the chance to answer the questions and uh, it was really good. It was a very, very nice conference. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so I want to ask you a couple of questions about yourself. Um, now, your your background, you sort of have a, a slight, you know, everyone has a different background and they approach these things uh, differently. So can you tell me some, uh, some of the, uh, something about some of the early work that you did uh, in 3D for your, your master's? Yeah, yeah, uh, you're right. It's 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 a little funny. The story it, it kind of um, is not the usual way how I ended up uh, what I'm doing right now. It basically started already when I was studying in Frankfurt, doing my bachelor's degree. That was also for biology, and I was going towards uh, the end of my degree, and uh, was I wanted to do or wanted to get some field experience. So I actually I, I knew that one professor had some projects going on in West Africa. So I, um, I contacted him and I was lucky enough to get the chance to do a project uh, with him. And um, basically I accompanied a PhD student at the time. He was doing research on the biodiversity on termite mounds in yeah, West Africa, basically in Burkina Faso and Benin. So I had the chance to go there for two months. And what we were oh. doing was yeah, it was basically what we were doing. We were collecting plants on the termite mounts and then later on uh, looking at the, the specimens that we collected and we wanted to ad identify them, right? To say, uh, this is this species, this is that species, right? Um, it was all good and fun. It was a really, really cool experience. However, I must say it was never really good at the identification of plants with the books. You know, you have to read the, the books and then go and, and, and check what is the morphology that you're seeing and so on. So at the point I had the idea that 
wouldn't it be cool if you had a 3D representation of a plant? It was mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, so there was nothing like this um, um, on the internet or something like this. So uh, when I came back, I straight went to um, another professor, a younger professor, and asked him if he wanted to do this project with me for my bachelor thesis. And it was, uh, yeah, he agreed, obviously. And then um, even even better, he had some connections with the Natural History Museum in Frankfurt, the Senckenberg Museum, and they had a 3D scanner. They had a structured light scanner. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, basically we scanned some plant morphologies, some infructocenes from the plants. It was a, a scanner by a company, I think Broekman. I don't think it exists anymore, but it's basically, you know, like a stereo system with a light. And um, it was quite hard actually to get the the structures and the 3D representation um, onto the computer because, yeah, I don't know if you can imagine. It was like really tiny, minute yeah. details. It's not really un- easy. However, it was a very fun project and it worked well. Um, and then I didn't I didn't give up. I just kept on looking for devices and technologies for um, 3D digitization of plant morphologies. Yeah. And then, I don't know, uh, fast forward a couple of years, I ended up doing my master's in biology. And as you already said, I uh, I was looking for, again, for 3D imaging and plants. And I came across, because I was looking for different methods, right, and and, and techniques. So I, I found that uh, computer tomography was something that I, I became really interested in. Mm-hmm. And um, I found this paper from a guy called Wolfgang Stuppi. He was working at the Kew Gardens, um, especially mm-hmm. in Ardingly, the Millennium Seed Bank. And he had a paper about uh, micro CT imaging of plant seeds. And I, yeah, basically I contacted him and asked him if if he wanted to do a master project with me and he agreed. Then again, we, we had to find the system to do the scanning. And um, funny enough, I ended up again at the Natural History Museum, but at this time it was in, in London. So I, I they had a micro CT scanner at hand and they allowed me to do the project. And and that's basically how I came to, to do all those things with, uh, with the CT and different other methods and technologies that I'm using right now. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I think I actually remember that paper on the CT on the seeds. I, it, it actually rings a bell. I, re, I remember mm-hmm. uh, at least I, I, I at least I went through it somewhat or whatever. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Of course, you know, micro CT can get down to very very small, um, you know, accuracies or dimensions. So that's pretty cool. And so, in 2015, how did you find your way into the Zurich? Uh, was it 2015 that you went to into the medical institute? Yeah, yeah, it was early, early in the, in 2015, I think February or March or something must have been, and yeah, when I when I finished my my masters, I I was I didn't have much money left because I was traveling so much for my studies. I studied here and there, uh, so I had to make a decision. I obviously wanted to do my my PhD, but I wanted to do it with 3D and with plants, and there was not many professors that had either the technology or the knowledge or we're looking doing something like this so i ended up at this company that you mentioned before and do with 3d and um, the cool thing was that they they are selling and supporting a, a, a software for 3d metrology actually it's 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 made um in in canada it's from a company from canada enough metric oh, and yeah. um the cool thing is that this software is not connected to any device, right? So basically it's open and you can use it with any device. So the lucky um, the lucky thing was that all the companies, all the big big names, you know, like, I don't know, Faro, Creaform, whatever, you name it, they were all using this software and they were all promoting it. And so we all had these, we had all those, all those um, systems at hand. So I could try basically anything. We had like laser scanners and structured light scanners and, and whatever. And that was really cool. And there was actually uh, a colleague of mine who mentioned someone working in, in, in Switzerland doing exactly the work that I'm doing right now. So one day I thought, wow, this is really interesting. 3D scanning, forensics, and uh, especially like, you know, forensic medicine, this would be Come really in, in handy because you know I study biology, so this would combine the engineering part and the biology part. Uh, so, yeah, then I looked it up on the internet. There was a uh, they were looking for 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 someone. They had an open position. I applied and I got the job. So basically, that's the story how I got there. That's yeah. awesome. So when you started, um, 
at the Institute, I mean, the, there's the ver, vertopsy is very popular. So people know about mm -hmm. the vertopsy for years now. It must be, I, I'm going to say it's got to be like 15, at least 15 years, or, or am I wrong? Yeah. Is it more than that, I think? Yeah, I think it started uh, early 2000s. Um, it was it started in Bern actually. Right. And then um, Professor Michel Tali, he's he moved to 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 um, to Zurich where he is now, and that's where the the vertopsy project continued. Continued. Yeah. So so when you when you started at the institute, did they say, hey, this is the project you're starting on, or was it how did how did you get into the Virto scan? Yeah. Um, so so basically. The the vertopsy group, right? Um, it's 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 like a, a group of of uh, like different specialists, and um, so we have I don't know we have radiologists, uh, forensic pathologists. They work together with engineers and um, uh, computer scientists and also physicists, right? Mm -hmm. So when everyone has their their part, what they're doing, and I was employed to do the three D scanning um, at the time. Um, also, I was in at the beginning. I was involved in the crime scene reconstructions together with the police. Um, and while we were doing the the scans, uh, my colleague Dominic Gasher and me, we, we we soon realized that I think there could be something done to make the whole setup go faster. So basically, everything was triggered by we want to be faster with the 3D scanning. Because mm -hmm. um, at the time, the system that we were using, um, we felt it was a little too slow. Um, so that's that's basically um, how it's how it started. And as I said, I think I started working there early 2015, and already in June, I think we had our first prototype, or at least we were building it. Yeah, because okay. I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. So you it's in, you already mentioned the amount of time that something takes. So I was just I was just thinking in my head about you know, current, uh, current methods of doing an autopsy. And I, I've spoken to people here locally at, at the uh, Ontario Pathology Service, and um, time is an issue because anything that costs them an extra 10 minutes, mm -hmm. they, they don't want to do it. Or, they, they, you know, it's, it's expect time is money, time is expensive. So whatever it is that you have to do needs to be quick, right? Unless it's absolutely necessary. And so time is an interesting thing, but what other, um, what other challenges or what other things were you trying or problems were you trying to solve with the VertiScan? Yeah. So, um, apart from the time aspect, we were, we were thinking that we could also, this was already done before. So we com we usually combine the, the 3d, the external scan, 3d body scan with the CT scan. Mm -hmm. This was already, already done, but it was done separately. So we do, first the CT scan and then the 3D scan or the other way around, doesn't matter. But um, basically we wanted to, to combine it partly because of the time, but also because it would help us also for, you know, for the reconstruction part um, later on. So when you and, say it was done separately, just so I understand, I, like the, you do the CT scan and then the body would be moved someplace else. And then the, and then the, 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 the surface scanning was done. Is that what you mean? Yeah, no, the, the body is not moved in this case. Okay, okay, okay. The body is always, um, we have the CT scanner. I don't know if everyone knows how it looks like. It's like a big donut shape. And then there is a, uh, a table where the, the person is positioned on. And of course, for the CT scan, the table moves through the, the gantry, the donut shaped thing. And um, when we do the... With it, when we do the 3D scan, basically the body is moved outside of the gantry, and then, but it's not the body itself is not moved, so it's always in the same position, so that we can that we can uh, combine those two um, data sets later on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But like a thing that that we really are trying to um, standardize and look at is also the color information. Because you know, if you have a 3D scanner, let's say, like a, a handheld scanner or something like this, often the 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 texture, the data for the texture that you get is is not as crisp as in a photograph, right? If you take a photograph of a, a certain area, then you get all the information that you can see with your with your bare eyes. But if you do maybe a 3D scan, depending on what what accuracy and what 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 kind of system you're using, it's it's a little blurry maybe, or the colors aren't right. So, but since we're using photogrammetry, we were we were trying to figure out and 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 are still working on this. 
of how to make this uh, a standard that that's yeah crisp and good and also uh, applicable all over the world to to receive the same kind of of information you know right. Yeah, so I mean, today I would say, like most autopsies, the the one tool that they'll use for documentation is the camera, anyway. So, um, right. you know, somebody's going around and just taking sort of, uh, I would say, unique photos. They're not doing it with the intent of photogrammetry, but they're doing it with the intent of recording an injury or something like this. So, which is um, which is different, let's say, than than the photogra the photogrammetric approach. Um, so, in terms of uh, like, I, like, okay, you're in Switzerland. So I've seen the setup. There's a lot yeah. of money. There's a lot of money there. Okay. So, and, and good. I mean, it's great that you guys are very well funded and people are willing to do this type of thing. But in terms of cost on a, a photogrammetry system, um, how does it compare to, you know, like the, you know, a CT scanner is, is quite a bit. Some institute, you know, some institutes or agency will have one, especially mm -hmm. if it's a, like a government lab, but to implement something like the, Virtual scan uh, with something like this. What are we talking about in terms of cost, more or less? Uh, that depends. We actually have different setups. Um, so we have very, very the prototype that we used um, at, at the beginning, or that we developed at the beginning. That's fairly cheap. I mean, I think we had seven cameras, DSLR cameras, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a DSLR camera. You can get like any any kind of camera. Um, if you want, basically, all you have to do is you have to trigger them sort of the same time if you uh, if you want to get the same photo. But um, I would say maybe a few, in this case, maybe a few thousand euros or Swiss francs, mm -hmm. uh, depending, of course, what kind of camera you are looking at, looking for, right? If you are going to a little bit more high quality DSLR camera, you will pay, you know, maybe 500 euros for the body and then the the, the lens also, I don't know, 100, 200 euros maybe, depending on what you get. So of course you said it's up. Um, and again, it depends on how many cameras you want. We have a setup, the newest setup um, we were trying and probably we will talk about later is uh, where we're just using four cameras and it works perfectly fine to get a, a, a full body scan. So right. for cameras is, is I think affordable, um, but of course you can go you can go very high. We have a setup that is um, quite expensive. It uses some very specific cameras. Um, that's not something everyone will be able to afford. But this is also for the research part, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of money, because you said, uh, of course, some institutes have a CT scanner, and and that's one of the the. The setups that we have that this is basically dedicated to the CT scan, right? But we also thought about not just using it in the CT room, but also using it in the autopsy room. First of all, because there's information we can get there that we can't get in the CT room, um, you know, during the autopsy, for instance, right. or something like this. Um, but also just to show that you can get something like this in any room where you have a, a table that either is still or moves. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me ask you about the progression of uh, like how it started. And then of course there, there's been, a, it seems like there's been, I don't know how many iterations in total that you've had on this, but um, there, there's some really great papers here for those that are interested. And I'm just showing some of them right now, but um, I, I don't know if there's one prior to this one, but this one shows 2016. So I don't know, was this one of the first ones that you were involved with on the VirtuScan? Uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, there's two papers that more or less came out at the same time. This is the conference paper, but it's fine. We can go through this one. Um, this is the the conference one from the, the three body scanning technology. And this is the setup, how it looks like. Okay. So um, this is the, the prototype. As you can see, it's a uh, it's a it's a mo yeah no you can't see that it's mobile, but it has some some wheels on the on the bottom, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a very easy thing we had a carpenter um, close to our institute and we just asked him if he could you know build something like that we gave him some drawings and and it's just made of wood so it's, right, right, right. that's not really expensive if you're handy you can do it yourself okay i'm gonna i'm gonna show you something and i don't want you to laugh at me okay because yours looks way more professional but but i'm gonna show you this anyway let me move it over here sure Okay. Oh, yeah, you, you got your own. <laughs> <laughs> you got your own scan. That's cool. So this was done with a student. Now it doesn't look as nice as yours, but it did work. So uh, 
I just want to show that this was back several years ago too, but you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, the concept, you know, that you have of, of this idea, I think is, uh, well, of course, if there's a, a good solution to something, then you tend to go to the same idea or the same solution. Exactly. But, so when I saw this, I was like, man, is it, <laughs> it looks so similar. So that's it great. Does, yeah. And so uh, what, what did you do with this one and how much testing did you do on this one? Um, so yeah, this one um, was we started. Uh, yeah, you saw it's 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 from 2016, so it's like I don't know, about after half a year or something of of developing this or building this. Basically, um, we used it, and this is just to show how the how the setup works. We we put it in front of the CT. So in the back of the the photo, the donut shape again. This is the the CT gantry. And um, yeah, as you can see, there's like a, a dummy, a puppet that that um, you know is 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 in in place where usually the the, the person would would lie. And then we combine both. We can use the, the table from the CT scanner to move in iterative steps. So in this case, I think it was 10 centimeters that we moved it, and then we stopped and we took um, all the photos, and then we did this again from head to toe. Basically, this is what the the um, the image on the on the right side indicates this is a CT scan, um, and then these little steps or these 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 lines there should indicate these steps that we did. And you can actually do the CT scan in an iterative way as well, and then later on merge uh, the the segments. You could do that, or you could just use the table movement and then later on do like a full CT scan. But I think, uh, I mean, I'm not a, a CT technician, but I think in older times, it, it was, or in, in former times, it was it was common to do just like step-by-step -step scanning right, or right, something right. like this. Okay, yeah. so, you, so you can move it both ways. The table can go mm -hmm. in, or you could take the device and then, and then just pull it over uh, the body if you wanted to. But obviously, you have more control with the table. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, that's true. You could also do it and use it in the in the um, autopsy room, for instance. We used it in 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 combination with um, uh, cadaver lifts, for instance, just to show that that yeah, because it's mobile, you can move it. But yeah, as you said, obviously it's a little it's a little difficult to maneuver this thing. Yeah, this is this is the the photo where we try to to show how it could be done. Obviously, it works, but then you always have to measure. You know, by eyesight, this is ten centimeters more or less, and then move it again. Right. Um, it works, but it's a little for routine work. It's not really. Uh, this would be on um, in the autopsy room, the autopsy mm -hmm. table. Yeah, so it works same way, but yeah, it's so a little. Mm -hmm. How long did so? How long did you hold on to this particular model before you migrated to the next version? Uh, let me think. I think we applied for some money right after that because we saw that it worked. And we we the the next step was basically that we got the the system uh, which is called VertiScan on Rails. Um, this is basically ah oh yeah you have this this one there as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as you as you saw before, we we used it in the autopsy room and with the cadaver lifts, but it was a little difficult to maneuver and not not so great for routine work, especially if everyone is working there and you come with a big uh, rig and you say, like, everyone move away, we got to do this, <laughs> then it's a little um, hard to do. And so we uh, we got a company from, from Austria that we do some other work with um, and we asked them if they could help us with this specific idea. So what we did is we, we, we used the same... Um, architecture the same structure of the system we just use this this ring shape with um, multiple cameras and instead of um, moving it on the floor we we um, attach it to the ceiling because um, because the floor in the autopsy room as you can imagine there is you know like fluids and stuff it's it's not so clean and also because people are standing there it it, it felt better to have it on the on the ceiling mm -hmm. so basically it runs on two linear axis and it can it can go from one table we have two tables which are aligned um behind each other and we can we can scan on both both tables basically okay yeah this in, is in one of the figures yeah you're showing how it moves but it also like swings out of the way yeah but this is this is something <laughs> this is a is a cool feature but it's just because um 
uh, we didn't have enough space to store it. <laughs> we wanted to have like a, a cupboard where you could just, you know, move it into and then close it. But because we remodeled the whole uh, autopsy room, and the, the tables got bigger, so we didn't have as much space as we had before. So the, the the solution we came up with is just storing it under the ceiling, so no one can basically touch it and and run against it. And it, yeah, because it's still a little fragile because of the, the cameras, and, and yeah, that's why we we did this. Right, right, okay. And so is is this the last iteration of what you have now, or was there, uh, was there something else? There's probably maybe some additions after this. Yeah. Yeah, there is some addition. So um, we we continued. I think then I have to share something on my side. Let me see. Um, so this should be the one. Can you see the? Let me bring that up here in a second. Photo. Okay. Uh, nothing yet. I just get a. I'm just got a black screen there. You may have to try and share it again. Oh, okay. Hang on. Uh, I'm gonna do that again. Share. There it is. Oh yeah, I see it now. Yeah. So this one um, should do it bigger. No. Um, this one is now the newest uh, iteration. Basically, it's um, a system. As you can see, it's again used in combination with the CT scanner. We haven't published it, but it was already all over the news. So basically, <laughs> it is kind of published. Um, the the idea is the same as before, but we added some 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 different cameras, for instance, and we also added some extra lighting, as you can see. So yeah. each camera basically has its own light, because um, first of all, because it's bigger and it's it's close on the top, we had problems uh, that that the light was not enough, and we felt like we wanted to use daylight. Um, so this is the the first idea that we had to use a sort of a standard, which we later on figured out that it's not so easy for light to, to get the perfect standard. So light um, is a very interesting topic and we are learning a lot about this and um, this is probably not the last step. Um, actually it isn't because we already ordered some other lights, but, <laughs> okay. but um, this is the, the setup we have right now. And um, the cameras you can see are, are different cameras now. I don't know um, if it's possible to see it on the screen you see if I can maybe yep. zoom in. So these ones here, they are not DSLR cameras anymore. They look uh, like they're industrial being... cameras, then. Exactly. So they're industrial cameras, and they are three chip cameras. So basically, there is a there's a little prism inside that that splits the light, and we have an R, G, and B um, sensor basically. So they are um, distinct. So we can we can get the the color information for each of the three colors. Um, separately and the idea is sorry yeah i don't know i was just saying that's great yeah. that's very very cool yeah yeah and the idea is to of course look at the color information to get better colors true colors or as true as possible and that's also the combination with the light right so we want to standardize this we want to look at this how can we you know um make this even better than the the standard setup but since we were talking about financial costs and 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 um, this obviously is a system that's that's not just a few thousand, right? Because the cameras itself are quite expensive, the light, and then we have an extra um, computer that's that's uh, down here. The whole setup is is built with aluminum profiles, as you can imagine. It's it's not the the cheapest setup that you can probably think of. Right, right, right. Sure, sure. I mean the. The cheapest setup would be one camera and then just, you know, have somebody take a bunch of photos. I mean, yes. it's, not very, it's not efficient, but uh, yeah, that, that would be cheap. But uh, exactly. no, that that's super slick. And in terms of, um, I'm interested in the performance of something like this and under the yeah. different types of situations that you have. So uh, gunshot injuries or when, for example, you know, the body is partially open, uh, fluids like bodily fluids and things like this. Um, mm -hmm. How does it perform under some of these different uh, situations? Yeah, actually quite well. So um, for like, uh, maybe one thing that I should mention is the, the, the one thing that's also different here is that we don't do it in steps anymore. That's actually a very important part that I forgot to mention. Mm -hmm. So what it does, it's, it's uh, scanning while the CT scan runs, basically. Oh. So the whole thing uh, does a whole body scan in, let me think, I think the CT scan is 79 or 75 seconds. Wow. 
Yeah. So we acquire photos while the the body moves in with a with a standard speed of the of the table. So this is this is what we wanted to achieve, right? Because the other thing with the the, the steps is is still much faster than what we were using before. But this one here is at the speed of the CT scanner, right? right. Um, of course, you have to take into account that we have to do the three D reconstruction later on, right? That, that we don't have the three D data set. Uh, right after that, but that's not the important thing because, as we said, right, we want to we want to use the body, um, or we want to get we want to have the chance to use the body as soon as possible for other examinations or even to you know um, clear the body so it's it's free to leave the institution. Right. Um, yeah, about the about the quality and and how it performs. Um, as I said, I think it's it's. It performs quite well. We 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 used it in combination with the the older setup that we use, which is a structured light scanner. Mm -hmm. And when you have um, body scans, especially when there is fluids, as you mentioned, right? This is really hard to capture. So if you have a wound that is very wet because there is still some blood, or I don't know, because you just cleaned the body and there is still some water left, either you have to take. Um, a lot of time to to really dry and clean it up or yeah you can um either lose the information and yeah this is a this is a very good example actually mm -hmm. this is the setup from the autopsy um room so the vertiscan on rails as it is called and this is an open body right so there would be a lot of, of fluids uh or you know like definitely some some re reflective surfaces yeah. Um, but as you can see, it works quite well. I don't know if you want to zoom into the... Yeah, there's, there's, I'll go on this side here, but you can see all yeah. the, uh, the parts here, whatever. I mean, it's uh, a little graphic for some people, but the detail exactly. is actually quite impressive. And um, I, there was another image that I was going to look at. I think it's this one here. And this has to yeah. do with like the surface, uh, the surface that you're picking up. Um, what can you tell me about sort of just the, the, the quality that you get off of the skin under different mm -hmm. scenarios? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you can see, this the the images there. They're actually referring to some tests that we did. So the left side, uh, A and C, is from something that didn't work quite as well, and then we we changed something. Uh, so B and D is where it worked a little bit better. I'm not sure. Probably it's not really visible uh, through the screen on on YouTube, but. Um, yeah, you, I think you can see you can see uh, mm -hmm. lots of lots of details on the skin. These are the the DSLR cameras. They they have a little higher um, quality, a little higher accuracy um, than the the three uh, three chip cameras. Mm -hmm. So the the quality here, in terms of the three D model of the polygon, would be a little bit higher than the the other one. But the the color information is yeah as you as you know from a normal standard dslr camera but you can get very very detailed information on the on the surface but of course there is setups that would give you better 3d information you know if you use a, a very high quality uh 3d scanner you know used in industry for metrology then you get better better information, better data. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I haven't used the latest setups that are available there. But usually those setups, I think they don't perform as well when it's wet or when you have hair. So the hair is usually not shown at the setups. And um, also when there is yeah, open wounds, like I don't know how well it would perform on the autopsy um, body. I right. think probably not as well. Yeah, I believe in the. I've I've seen images before in the uh, the vertopsy images that there's uh, there's actually a, like a structured light scanner like mounted yep. on a robot arm kind of thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that would go around and basically acquire all of the different angles and all the different shots necessary, which mm -hmm. probably takes. I, I imagine it's going to take a lot longer than just you know 70, 80 seconds of acquisition yes. time. There. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's really yeah. interesting. Um, so. There was something else I, I uh, that you spoke of um, before, and that had to do with uh, different types of imaging or different types of uh, wavelengths of light and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Can you tell us about what kind of things you have planned or what, what's currently implemented uh, yeah. at the moment? Sure. Um, actually, I have maybe something that I could show here Sure. Um, for the audience. Let me see um, if I can share this. 
this is actually from the presentation. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, what we what we see here is the is the um, electromagnetic spectrum or part of it, and um, we have all the 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 different um, parts like the X rays, ultraviolet, infrared, microwaves, and so on. And what we can see right, as humans with our eyes is basically just a very very small part. I think most people know that, but this is the what it's called. Um, the visible spectrum, right? It ranges, well, let's say approximately from 400 to 700 nanometers. Mm -hmm. And um, there is some information that we, of course, cannot see that's outside of these parts. So for instance, a UV light and infrared radiation, right? This can help us to, to see some structures. I think well, everyone who watched, I don't know, CSI and these kind of things, and they, they know that when you use, for instance, uh, ultraviolet um, radiation, you can make things appear and they, it's, you know, you use UV um, induced fluorescence, right? So basically you can see different stains like like sperm or bodily fluids like um, uh uh, saliva and and sweat and urine these kind of things they 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 fluorescence and and when you when you work with digital cameras which are using a CMOS sensor right which is the, the common sensor that we find maybe in the the DSLR cameras that we use then um, they are naturally able to see more than than we can right mm -hmm. so you just have to remove a little part that's that's built into the camera but if you modify this there is specialists that do that um, then you can take this out and replace it with another you know uh, multispectral filter and then you can use the camera and special lights to see the ultraviolet or the infrared part as well mm -hmm. and then you can um, in the in the forensics area there's a lot of it's often called alternate light sources right so you use like narrow bands of light for instance, uh, like around 500 nanometers or 600 nanometers or something like this. And then you can see specific parts uh, that you otherwise wouldn't recognize. And then you use specific filters. And what we did, um, I can show maybe another photo of the setup. Let me see if I can share this. No, it doesn't pop up. Why not? <laughs> um, try again. Oh, there it is. I think I can just go through. Hang on. That's the one. OK. Gotcha. So once again, we're back at the prototype, but it's just easier to, to use that, that setup. Uh, it doesn't look much different than the one where they, that we were using at the beginning. But what we are having here now, it's it's the four camera four camera setup. We have four modified DSLR cameras. That means you know we, we took out this 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 filter that mm -hmm. blocked the UV and the infrared light. And now we are having some extra light sources here as you can see. So maybe let me zoom in. So this little light source here with the red dot is the infrared light. Mm -hmm. And we attach this to each of the cameras. And now what we can do is we can we can we can use this, um, shut all the other light, and then we can take images in the in the infrared, the UV, or use the UV uh, induced fluorescence to to see you know stains, other latent um, evidence that otherwise wouldn't be possible to see with the eye. Okay, interesting. So this is a different setup, though, and and uh, you have to set up beforehand to ensure which lights you're gonna are gonna turn on, which filters you have on the lenses, things like this. Is that, that mm -hmm. is that is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, automated would be the wrong way to call it. Probably, um, I mean the, the the setup still works the same. You know, we we remove the body and steps, but as you said, we have to change the lights if we want to go from infrared to UV or the other way around, and um, if we want to. Uh, yeah, capture the photos. We also have to apply a filter to the to the camera lens each okay. time, and then do the white balancing, find the right settings. So it's a little bit more work. But okay. this is, yeah, let's say this is the the first step to something that will come afterwards. I now know. Um, I have no photo of this, um, 
But if you remember, hang on, I can just switch here. Um, if you remember this setup, um, there is something built onto it, which is not shown in the photo. Um, and soon we are going to go uh, hyperspectral. So we are going to use hyperspectral imaging cameras to do that. Mm -hmm. um, this is still work in progress, but it's uh, hopefully, I mean, it sounds very promising and I'm really looking forward to see the system working because then we can get all the, the spectral yeah. range in, in one motion basically, and it will save us a lot of time. So, and maybe, yeah, since I had this picture here. So this is sort of uh, the idea, right? We have, if we look at this photo, we have uh, the two first images here or parts of the image show the skeleton and some some rendering from the CT data. So this is what we can get, of course, some more, but this is like representation what we can get from the computer tomography. And then we also have the near infrared information, the ultraviolet and the visible light. So the visible light is that what's you know commonly used. Um, and these things here, they are known. I mean, of course, the forensics, uh, they use this already, but in order to make it uh, to use it for a whole body, it's it's not it's not a it's not common knowledge I think. And the interesting thing is, um, especially if we go into infrared, um, there is like an information gap that we are hoping to fill, right? Because if we have the visible light information and the external structure, then we see the the world as we see it with our eyes. Right. And when we go to the X-ray information that, that's um, shown by the computer tomography, then we see what's inside. And with the infrared, there is certain windows where we can go a little bit deeper under the skin. Mm -hmm. um, it's not much, obviously, but there there is a little information gap that, hope, that we hope that we can fill with this technique. And so basically, yeah, fill up. Uh, yes, that's, that's awesome because, uh, yeah, I think it's great because, uh, well, infrared can help with, for example, if there's any uh, markings or hematoma that you can't tell, um, tattoos, I know it helps to enhance like yeah. sometimes uh, things like tattoos and things, gunshot residue uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so things like that, that maybe, you know, it's just, it, 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 they don't appear to the naked eye and all of a sudden, you know, something may just pop up in front of you. And it's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that was there. So yeah, I, I think that that the the use or the the use case makes uh, a, a whole ton of sense. So uh, exactly. Um, can you talk about the uh, uh, so, for example, in the image that you showed with the converted cameras with the full spectrum cameras? What kind of cameras are you using? Um, this is just Canon um, Canon cameras. I think uh, the specific model would be EOS. 200D. I think okay. they're not available more anymore, but it doesn't matter. We would have done it with the 100D, which we are using sure, the sure. other setup. But uh, anything would work. You just have to find someone who would uh, modify the camera. I mean, you can do it yourself if you're if you're handy enough. But yeah, if you buy a camera for I don't know, like 500 euros, and you use the screwdriver and you you break it, it's, it's not much fun. So yeah. it's better to, to pay someone to do it properly. Yeah, yeah. We 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 have one and we purchased it all like, you can buy like you can just buy whatever camera you want and then they'll mm -hmm. just uh, do the conversion. So it, it's just as simple to do it that way. Um in terms of controlling everything and and uh operating the entire system, do you have some kind of you have some kind of custom software that brings in all the all the photographs into one location and and what about the processing like what is like the workflow from once you've captured the photos yeah so that's a little different for each setup so the prototype basically we had um uh, remote shutter controls that were just very cheap uh, i think young new was the was the company uh bought them on amazon i think and um so they're just easy, you just remote control, you push a button and they all click at the same, more or less at the same time. Um, and at the beginning, I think we were just saving the data on the on the SD cards and then collected them separately and then put them in the computer. Um, later on, we had a, we had them connected directly to a computer as it was shown on the, on the photo. And then we were using a software, I think it was called DSLR, Pro remote or something like this, mm -hmm. um, but there's nowadays there's a lot of companies that do these kind of 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 uh, software. So I think there is even better software available now than that we were was using. It, I was thinking, was it uh, Digicam Control? No, nah, it was called I think DSLR Pro Remote or something okay. like this. 
yeah uh, i think it was from the uk ah, okay um, but nowadays i think there's a, a, a very interesting company is a x angle or something that that you could okay. check out um and yeah for the system that that's used in the in the autopsy room we're still using the dslr pro remote mm -hmm. um and then the company you know set up all of the the wiring so basically it's all connected to the computer and once we're we're done we have the folder with all the data nice. and with the setup that's the newest one um, with the three chip cameras basically the the company that sold us the cameras and helped us to set up the setup uh, yeah helped us to set up the whole system they um they had a capturing uh software that helped to to get everything uh, in place and then it's all saved by name in a folder. Yeah. So well, that's interesting though. But when you when you have the the three chip cameras, um, do you have to reassemble the RGB? Im like, there's three separate images. There's an RGB, yeah. or or is it just, or is there something different? Does it automatically assemble it for you? Yeah, it's automatically assembled. It it just uh, we asked for a BMP format, I think. Okay. You okay. BMP, yeah. But the the software is is very diverse. I think you can do whatever you want. You could just get the the three channels separately proper, proper probably yeah i think so but now we just get the bmps because then we can just like put them into um agisoft and, and do the 3d reconstruction right away yeah okay yeah and i was just going to ask you about the software so you, you're using uh, uh metashape, uh, metashape. Uh, mm -hmm. from agisoft or whatever and yeah is, is that one that you you all feel comfortable with or have you ever tried different software yeah, so far we uh, I want to say I grew up with <laughs> with MetaShape or with the uh, photo scan I think it was called before, yes. um, but now we are using or I just uh, got hold of what's it called Reality Capture I think it's called, mm -hmm. but I'm still I'm still learning I'm still using it just to to try so we haven't applied it to all the data sets yet, but I think it's something we want to. We want to check. I think there's also a lot of free software, wasn't it called Meshroom or something? Or yeah, there's yeah. Meshroom. Uh, there's even uh, 3DF Zephyr, which has a free version. It allows you up to 50 photos, but even the the, the light version is like $200. It's very reasonable, yeah. and I think that gets you up to 500 photographs, something like this. Oh, so, okay. Which is an interesting point. So for a, a single body, about how much do you end up with? 200 photos. What what do you end up with normally? Uh, let me think. Yeah, I think 200 photos. It is for the um, autopsy room. I think it's 200 photos. I think for the CT room, uh, we recently changed some settings. So I think it's right now it's about 50 photos per camera. And we have eight cameras, I think, at the moment. Yeah. So, but that depends also how long the body is, because sometimes you have just, right. I don't know, like ten photos of nothing that you can just like delete um, in order to save some 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 time for the for the reconstruction. Right. Right. Oh, okay. I see. So once you have the model and you you produce this really nice three D model, what do you typically do with the the data? Like, is it uh, is it assembled with CT? Do you like? Um, oh, and before I forget too, I remembered I want to ask you the question about. Uh, often I'll see that you place small targets on the body. I've seen mm -hmm. some images like that, and I don't know if that's something that is helpful for assembling it with the CT or something like that. But can can you comment on what you do with the model and also the um, the targets as well? Mm -hmm. um, so with the setup that we had before, um, because it was a structured light scanner combined with a photogrammetry procedure, so um, there it was necessary to apply these little stickers. Um, that's probably what you saw. There's like this little white. Uh, I think it's a yeah, it's, it's a it's a black uh, circle with a white dot in the middle. Yeah. And um, those ones we don't need anymore with the with the photogrammetry. Um, set up and that makes it also much easier because then you don't have to put them on and then later on take them off because mm -hmm. it, it actually takes quite some time and um, so this was from before I, I, I would say um, or with the other setup and with the CT yes yeah, so the idea is that we always do a CT scan in combination with a, with a, with a 3D scan I mean, in case we do this in the CT room of course um, because that helps us later on to combine those two data sets for reconstructive purposes, right? Mm -hmm. So then we we give it to some other colleagues and and, and they they work closely uh, with the police and then they do the reconstructive work. Mm. And the normally the way it works is we 
we get the the surface model from the CT data, and we have the well, we already have the surface model from the surface scan, and then we just align them to each other, and then we can use them and turn them, and 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 that's 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 how we combine them usually. Okay, yeah. so so this has been in use now for for a while, and it's it's used on a, on on actual cases and everything yeah. else, correct? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is used uh, on a day to day basis. I mean the 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 combination of CT and surface scanning is 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 quite old. It's before I started, it was already uh, used. So um, this is something they are doing for for many years. I can't remember. I think early, uh, yeah, late nineteen nineties. I think was the first uh, papers that came out about how to combine photogrammetry data um, with some some stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've, I remember seeing uh, some of those early papers too, and, and it's interesting to note. I, I know some of the names. I, I know some of the couple of people I've met personally, which which is really nice that have worked on your team, and you've had a long list of people that have worked on the uh, the Bertopsy and, and, and in your group. Um, what about people who are like, other, for example, other agencies and and other uh, pathologists or whatever uh, around the world? I imagine that you know you guys must get some attention, or or is there do people call you for help on setting up systems like this? as well yeah um so one thing we have is the uh, the vertopsy course this is something that's that's usually happening annually uh, of course because of the corona situation it didn't uh um, happen this year and um, that's something everyone can can go and check out if they're interested they will learn about you know like the radiology part and exactly this is the website vertopsy and um there should be some information on it about the the vertopsy course um yeah, and and then you can apply and you learn about radiology and forensic pathology and and also the three D scanning and all the the setups and the, the techniques that we use. So this is something how we try to communicate with other um, institutions and so on. So this is something. But of course, if 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 anybody is interested, they can always uh, give us a call, write us an email, contact us. There's often people that that that. That come to our institute and do like a practical or an internship or something like this. Um, there's lots of possibilities, of course. So in case someone is listening and is interested, just yeah, write us an email and we'll see what we can do. Of course. Yeah, we, there's uh, information on how to get. If you just go to the Vertopsy website, there's uh, some different people on there, and I believe you make your your information, your contact information available. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Definitely. Um, so what what is um, what is the path going forward for the vertopsy? Like, what kinds of plans or what kinds of things can you discuss about you know where you you're headed in the future? Yeah. So um, I mean, I'm I'm mostly related to the the three D scanning. So I think um, if you want to know about the radiology and and all those things, I think the other colleagues would be probably best to ask themselves. But um, I think. Uh, from from my point of view, I really want to build something that's also usable outside of our institute, right? Because uh, I think the setups that we are trying to develop and and use, I mean, these 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 are just the first steps. I think I hope that at some point, and also with the help of this interview, people would uh, become more aware that there is something, there is opportunities to collaborate, and and yeah, if hopefully someone uh, is interested then we will go and, and install a similar system because you know some people have different arrangements maybe they don't have space on the ceiling so we mm -hmm. need to figure out something else or you know they they don't have a ct scanner and but i, I really really hope that that we will find um some way to to you know spread the news and also spread the system <laughs> towards uh, the, the world that, so that everyone can kind of benefit of the, the work that we're doing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, has any, are there, do you know of any agencies that have somewhat followed in your footsteps that have implemented something similar to this? Uh, not yet, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, might, maybe there is someone, because I mean, I didn't know that you were doing the same setups. <laughs> <somewhere. laughs> so I'm pretty sure someone also had the idea or is working on something like this. But as far as I know, no one, I mean, no one contacted me and asked about uh, about that yet. So, um, but it would be cool to hear about what, what their um, ideas are. And because, yeah, very, very interested. Okay, yeah. That's so, but, it, but you're not, I mean, you don't, you don't, 
do you sell, um, it's maybe stupid. Are, do you sell the system or, or is it just like you, you help people or it's just, uh, what, what's the arrangement there? Uh, no, so far we have nothing that we can sell because okay. it's all basically like you, you saw the systems, basically they're all based on, on this one rig or the other setups are still in development uh, stages. So mm -hmm. um, we have nothing to, to sell at the moment, but maybe at some point I would be interested to do something, you know, like maybe, you know, if someone asks, we can build something and then send it over. We had a, yeah, during the conferences, I sometimes get questions like, like this, do you sell something like this? And then I always have to ask now, it's, <laughs> it's nothing we have like stored somewhere that we can just ship to you. So yeah. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Well, I would uh, highly promote anyone that's listening to this, especially if you're a, you know, a, like a postgraduate student or something like that to reach out if you're interested in this area, because I think it's fascinating. I know that I, you know, I, I think it's a fascinating area and I would absolutely um, you know, want to get involved in something like this if possible. Interestingly, I when I was on the website, I actually saw that there is a, a student from the University of Toronto who I know who must have done ah. some 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 publication or something like that, uh, joint publication with your group, which I thought was really, really great. It was a nice surprise to see. So, um, but look, we're getting on in time here, Soren. Mm -hmm. And look, I want to say thank you so much for uh, all the information. Uh, I tell you what, you got a cool job. I have to tell you, like it's, <laughs> nice. you, you have a really cool job. And uh, I really like, uh, you know, you guys have done some really nice work. Uh, it just, it looks very polished. Uh, the results look really professional. And I give you guys credit too for the amount of publications and, and you get out there and spreading the word. Um, a lot of people do things sometimes and they don't they don't get it out there. But the fact that you you know are able to share the information and, and publish, I think, is is uh, for you and your group, I would say, uh, you know, good job and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me as well. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, listen, hang back. I'm just going to just do some closing remarks and then uh, I'll come back and chat with you after. OK, perfect. Thank you. All right. See you soon. Bye bye. All right, folks. Well, there it is. Uh, super interesting stuff, man. Um, really, really interesting. And uh, if you think about autopsies and where all of this uh, needs to go and such, um, it seems like uh, just just a no-brainer. Uh, it, it has so many benefits in, in many, many areas. So um, that does it for this uh, episode. Next week, I'm actually going to be on uh, training and I'm going to be doing my cloud compare course. And so uh, I may be tied up, but I'm going to try and find a way to squeeze something in. If I don't, I'll definitely be back uh, the following week. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll definitely uh, be in touch and see you soon. And thank you so much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.